we were stuck in traffic right outside of Houston for hours. A truck had overturned, and there was nowhere to go. We were literally just stopped. We were in an area that didn't have a lot of cell phone reception, so the drain on the battery was pretty frequent. And when that happens, you're forced to have a conversation. <laughs> and so we started talking. And all of a sudden, I heard what I thought were raindrops, but I looked around, and it wasn't cloudy. It was sunny. I said, what in the world is that? And then I looked to the skies to see more birds than I'd ever seen in my entire life and to discover that out of every car in the traffic jam, they had chosen mine to conduct target practice. <laughs> Literally, it was like my car was marked the porta potty at a concert because every car around us was fine. But my car, which was relatively new at the time, was just getting pelted. It was like a drone attack everywhere. So hours later, we finally made it home. And again, the car was somewhat new. And so I wanted to go and I wanted to wash the car right away. And Brooklyn looked at me and said, why are you going to wash the car right now? And I said, I want to get the car clean. And she kind of looked at me funny and said, really? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, this has happened before. Four, when we were conducting a student trip, and we had gone to Dallas, and we had, we had gotten lost, we had gone into, we, I mean, the car was just an absolute mess. You, you name it, it was dirty, it was filthy, it was gross. You could write on every inch of that car a message that people could see. It had that level of dirty on the outside. And she's like, I kept telling you all week how disgusting that was, and that didn't bother you. I said, baby, that was a rental car. I don't care. <laughs> but this is our car. Because we were devoted to it. We'd bought it. We'd bought in. This was ours. We owned it. I don't care about the car that I'm going to turn back. That's the beauty of the rental. You ride that sucker into the ground, and then you toss in the keys. That's fine gonna wash a rental car nobody washes a rental car no one washes a rental car and this morning we're going to see that things that we're devoted to they change us they change us this morning we're in acts 2 and what we see is a group of individuals who had been completely changed. Their lives were turned upside down because they had had an encounter with Jesus. And miraculous things have just happened. Jesus has just left this earth. And now he's left behind a group of people who follow him. And this is what we read in Acts 2. We're going to start in verse 42. If you have your Bible apps on your phones or tablets, feel free to follow along. If not, it'll be on, on the screens. But this is what we discover amongst this first group of followers of Jesus. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. And so the very first thing that we see that these followers of Jesus devoted themselves to, the very first thing is this, learning and applying the principles of God. The very first thing that people who followed Jesus devoted themselves to were learning and applying the principles of God. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were passionate about it. They were excited about it. They were eager for it. They were bought in. And not just that, but also to, to fellowship. They were, they were also bought in with community. They understood that they weren't to go through life alone, that they needed one another. 
And they had different circumstances than what we face today. And yet the need for us to understand that we need each other has not changed. And here the earliest group of followers of Jesus, they devoted themselves to learning and applying things so that they could become more like the one they followed. And they understood also a huge part of that was being in community. So the breaking of bread. That is communion. They devoted themselves to refocusing their lives because they understood that all of us are distracted. They understood that all of us have this battle that goes on within us. And it doesn't matter how long you've been following Jesus. You have this battle within you between the things that you want to do and the things that you know you shouldn't do. And sometimes you do really well in that battle. And other times you just want to give up because you feel like you've been defeated time and time in time again and yet they understood that there is beauty when we refocus ourselves and we take the time to do an inventory of our lives and we we intentionally look at the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf and we do the hard work of introspectively looking at our lives and seeing the areas that we need to change the battles that we need to fight, maybe the wars that we haven't even begun to wage and the things that we need to let go of and the things we need to cling on to. So they devoted themselves to refocus around the sacrifice of Jesus and to prayer, which is a dependency issue. It's, it's just acknowledging the fact that they were dependent upon God. And many of, us are, many of us are gifted individuals. Many of us have a lot of talents and abilities. And what can happen subtly is we think, I got this. We don't say that as much. We're not like, nah, I'm good. I don't need God. And yet in our conduct, if, if people didn't know any better, they would look at us and say, we're not relying on God. We're relying on our own strengths, our own abilities, our own talents. Because if you were to look at our lives, if you were to inventory our lives, there isn't that level of dependency that is readily available by us taking the time to be intentionally prayerful about what's going on in our lives. And so here are these people whose lives have been radically altered, whose lives have been radically changed by God, and they devote themselves to these four things to learning and applying the scriptures, to community, to refocus their lives in communion, and to celebrate their dependency by calling on God in prayer. Check this out. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now here's the deal. We can't control God's acting. We can't control how God acts, but we can ready ourselves. We are not responsible for the ways in which God acts. We can't command that. We can't call it down. We can't do any of those things. But what we can do is we can ready ourselves in preparation for God acting. And it's only after we're told that they devoted themselves to these four things that were then told, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. God shows up, and he does the miraculous. And he doesn't do the miraculous through every single individual. But through a select group, we're told here by Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, we're told that God shows up and he does some incredible things through a select few. Understand this, miracles weren't normative. Miracles weren't normative at any point in time in Scripture. Out of everyone who's ever been thrown overboard, we know of one who was swallowed by a great fish. And then vomited back up onto dry land. So I don't mean to freak you out. But if you get thrown overboard in the middle of a storm in, in a great sea or the ocean. Pray, 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 pray really hard. But understand you're about to meet Jesus face to face. You're probably not going to be swallowed by a great fish. 
We know of one story where people are thrown into a furnace that is blazing hot and on fire, and they come walking out unharmed by that fire. We have numerous accounts of martyrs for the faith who have been tortured and killed. And God chose not to act in that same way. And the reason that I tell you this is because when we set ourselves up to think like God has to deliver us a miracle, we set ourselves up for disappointment. Can God do the miraculous? Yes. Does God still do the miraculous? Yes. Is the miraculous normative? No. And maybe some of you are upset and disappointed right now because honestly, You feel like God hasn't shown up in a way that he should. And you've believed, you've been promised, you've bought in. You you have set yourself to receive a miracle. And for whatever reason, God has chosen to act differently. And truth be told, that has made you bitter. It has made you want to throw in the towel. You are hurt, and you're angry, and you're upset. And I want you to know, it's okay to be hurt. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be upset. It's okay to be bitter. None of that catches God by surprise. But understand this. God's action is not dependent upon us. And we will never fully understand all the ways that God chooses to work and chooses to intervene. Or sometimes it seems like he doesn't intervene at all. But understand, God is still at work. Even if you can't see it at that time. Now here's what's incredible. These, this group of people, they got to see in real time. They got to see in real time God's working. And a lot of, for a lot of us, and a lot of times in our lives, we have to look back. See, they got to see the wonders. They got to see the signs. They got to see all these incredible things that the, the apostles were doing. And they got to see it play out in real time. But oftentimes in our lives, we don't get that benefit. We have to look back, and then when we get further from the circumstance, when we get further from the situation, it becomes clearer and clearer of how God was working. But oftentimes, in the moment, it makes no sense to us. We're like, God, where are you? What are you doing? And God is at work. We just can't see it. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were unified. And so Lakeside, I just want to beg you, I just want to implore you, let this be a call for us that we say, no matter what, we as people who call Lakeside home, we will be unified. We will understand that there are going to be Republicans, there are going to be Democrats. We understand that we're not going to agree on every issue politically. We understand for the next six weeks, we are going to be inundated, and their tensions are going to be high. And you're going to think, wow, you're so stupid if you don't see things in the way that I see things. And you're going to think, well, how could you look at something like that? And you're going to think, well, Jesus would vote this way. No, he wouldn't. Jesus would vote this way. And you're just going to be convinced that you're right and maybe you are but maybe you're not so let's instead just make sure that we do this let's all just breathe right now just just breathe with me all right there have been times when republicans were presidents 
There have been times when Democrats were presidents. There have been times when Wisconsin has had a Republican governor. There have been times when Wisconsin has had a Democratic governor. There have been times when you have liked nominees com confirmed to the Supreme Court. There have been times when you haven't liked nominees confirmed to the Supreme Court. None of that changes our focus. None of that changes our mission. As followers of Jesus, the main thing that we are to do is follow Jesus, not a political ideology. The number one thing we are to do at Lakeside is to follow Jesus. It's to introduce people to Jesus. And so if you're a Republican, we love you. If you're a Democrat, we love you. If you're an independent and you hate all the politicians, we really love you. But I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you, you are welcome here regardless of your political ideology. And we're not going to be the place where we're going to get into all the political fights. We're going to agree to disagree about some things, but we are going to guard our unity. And we are going to say that there are things that are greater to us than politics. And that is going to be our focus over the course of the next six weeks. Now, once you get off our parking lot, do whatever you want. And whatever you want to do on your Facebook page, you do on our fa your Facebook page. But when you're following following us at Lakeside Community Church on Facebook, as you should be. And if you're not, now's a great time to pull out your phone and go on to Facebook and follow us. But just keep it off our wall because we don't care. All right. We don't care. But we love you and we need to love each other and understand that people are more important there than their political views. And so we are going to keep that at the center. Listen, this first church didn't they didn't agree on every single facet of life, but they understood something. That Jesus trumps everything. And so that must be our focus here too. And when there is a call, when, when there is a call to unity that is accepted and people are unified, synergy is possible. And when you're not unified, synergy is impossible. If you don't believe me, go to a sixth grade band concert. It's painful. I was a student pastor for four years. There's a lot of fake smiles on my face and a lot of polite applause. And I just flat out lied. You guys sounded great. I had to pray for repentance. They were terrible because they're just learning their instruments. They can't, they haven't masked, they haven't mastered their own instrument, let alone all coming together to play a song in unison. But when you're unified, when you're on the same page, synergy is possible. Lakeside, this is a call for us to say we will be unified so that synergy is possible and we can operate firing on full cylinders so we can reach as many people as possible for Jesus. Will there be times you don't like the songs that are played? Yep. Will there be times that you're like, wow, that sermon sucked? Yep, because there's going to be some that are awful. I'm just telling you. That's how I'm going to, I'm like, yeah, that was, I'm really sorry. Come next week, I'll try better, I promise. Will there be times where you come to a program and you're like, well, they should have done that differently. Yeah, you know why? Because we're human and we're flawed. But let's just say we together are going to do everything we can to point people to Jesus. And we're going to learn together and we're going to grow together and we're going to give it our best. And we're just going to say that my, my preference isn't as important as reaching people for Jesus. That is why we're here. And this is a call, Lakeside, that we just say right now, we're going to be intentional about being unified. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Understand this, generosity is a hallmark of faith. Generosity is a hallmark of faith. And if you're here and you're like, ah, yep, there it is, knew that was coming. All the church cares about is my money. Then I'm just going to challenge you this. Don't give to Lakeside. If that's your mindset, we don't want your money. Now, what you're going to discover, what you're going to discover is this. That there is work that God wants to do in and through you that will never be completed until you really are generous. 
And if you feel that way, by the way, then this probably isn't the place for you because you're not bought into the mission and the vision. We want people who are excited and who are bought in to the mission and the vision. And that's not to say that if you if you want to be a part, if you want to come to Lakeside, that we just want your money. Nothing could be further from the truth. But what we do want you to understand is the freedom that comes when we worship not our possessions. But when we're faithful and we let God work and we trust him. There's a reason that Jesus talked more about money than he did heaven and hell. Because one of the greatest indicators of your faith is your bank account. Who are you trusting? Generosity, generosity is a hallmark of faith. You can't avoid it. You can't separate it. And so if, if you're like, but you don't understand how tight the budget is, Brian, I just want to challenge you with this. Just give something. Just give something. I don't care if it's a dollar. I don't care if it's five dollars. Just give something and put God to the test to see if he'll meet your need. Start small, but just do something and see how God will work. And he'll meet your needs. Generosity is a hallmark of faith. And here are the people who are the earliest followers of Jesus. And they're unified and they're devoted and they see people in need. And they don't just say, oh man, I, I wish I could help, but times are tough. No. They cared for each other so much that they gave to the point that it cost them something. They sold what they had. So that the needs of others could be met. Lakeside, thank you for those of you who give. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I cannot begin to tell you literally the hundreds of people that are impacted here and in this community because of your generosity. The stories of families that you will never be able to fully know because we value confidentiality and we're working on a way that we can share some of the details of what you have done as a direct result of your generosity. But from my heart, I want to say thank you because we have been a source of hope for people who felt like there was nowhere else for them to turn and we can point them to Jesus in the process because of your giving, because of your sacrifice. For those of you who give Thank you for those of you who don't. We're not angry at you. We're not mad at you. But I'm just letting you know you're stealing from yourself the ability for God to do some really incredible things in your life. And my challenge for you today is start small, but do something. Maybe it's a dollar. Maybe it's five. But see what happens when you give how God will bless you. Because he will. And this isn't some promise, like if you give a dollar in the offering plate, that you're going to go to the mailbox this week and a thousand bucks is going to show up. This isn't something like that. But generosity is a hallmark of faith. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor. With all the people. And here we see it. Walking in community. Attending the temple together. Breaking bread in their homes. Relationship. And they were thankful. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. Praising God. I just want to ask a question. Are you a thankful person? Are you thankful? Because here's the trap. We can focus on what's not going well. 
We can focus on our problems. We can focus on all the things that we wish we, we had that we don't have. We can focus on all the, all the things that are just bringing us down. We can focus on everything that's going wrong and in the process miss everything that's going right. Are you thankful? And then lastly, we see this. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. See, they were infectious. When people looked and they saw, they wanted to be part of something like that. They wanted to be part of something bigger. They wanted to be part of something greater. They wanted to be part of a community like this community. They saw that they were different. They saw that things like that they had going on there weren't like the things they had going on in their own lives. And they saw what happens when the hope of Jesus is lived out in people's lives. Because they were devoted. And they were bought in. And so if you're giving Lakeside a test drive, we are so glad you're here. But if you've decided that Lakeside's for you, then what I'm asking is for you to grab a bucket and grab a towel. Because nobody washes a rental car. But when it's yours, you're devoted. And so if you call Lakeside home, I'm asking you, grab the bucket, grab the towel, and let's get to work. How? How can we do that? First, invest. Invest in Lakeside. Make it a priority in your life. Make being here a priority in your life. Make telling people about this place a priority in your life. Give generously here. Make it a priority. Invest in Lakeside. Second, we're asking you to engage with people. Engage with people. Now, I understand that some of you are introverts, and you're like, oh, I, I engage. Like a conversation a week is good for you. And that's fine. If, if you're an introvert, I'm not beating up on you. But I just, I just want you to know that we understand you don't need as many connections as extroverts do. And some of you are extroverts. And you can have 30 quality conversations a week. And you're like, man, does anybody even care about me? And you're like, are you serious? Like five people a day are sitting there just pouring into you. What do you mean? We understand that there's this balance, but for, for the most introverted person, you still need connection. And for the most extroverted person, understand that the introverts, you're like a traveling salesman to them, okay? So just cool it down a little bit. It's not that they don't love you, but it's just you're a lot, okay? We still love you, but just take a breath. Take a breath. But regardless of whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you need community. So make sure that you're invested in the lives of others. None of us are called to go through life alone. Make sure that you're invested. Third, refocus. In just a couple minutes, that's what we're going to do together. And if you've 
if you're somebody who's made the decision to follow Jesus and you've given him your life, then we invite you to take part of this. If you haven't yet given your life to Jesus, we're just going to ask that you let this pass you by because if you take it, you're just going to think that is the world's worst appetizer that I've ever had in my life because you're, you're just not, you're just not going to get it. And that's, that's okay. We're so glad you're here. But what we're going to be doing is, is called communion. And what this is is it's just us remembering the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. And so there's, there's little pieces of, of bread or, or crackers. And what that reminds us is that we believe that all of us have, have made poor choices in our lives, something that the Bible calls sin. And God is perfect and he hates sin and he has a standard of perfection and none of us meet that standard. And so God still loves us in spite of that fact. So he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus was fully God and he was fully man. Divinity and humanity on full display met in, in one person, the God man Jesus. And he died on the cross for our sins, meeting a sacrifice that none of us could meet. And three days later he rose again. But this helps us refocus our lives and it helps us look inwardly it helps us do some introspection to see things that we need to change about ourselves to become more like jesus and if any of those things are present then just as the song plays we're just going to invite you where you're at just to quietly pray and ask god to go to work in your life and just hang on to it and then i'll come back up and we'll eat it together and we'll drink the juice together just to be reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus. But when we're asking you to buy in, we're just asking you to regularly refocus. And sometimes that'll be communion. And other times it will just be introspectively take inventory of your life. And lastly, we're asking you to pray. Make it a point right now. Pull out your phone. Make it a point. Set yourself a, a reminder in your calendar just once a day for the next week. Just once a day. If everyone here would devote themselves to at least once a day, pray for God to work here at Lakeside and to do some incredible things. Can you imagine what God will do when we collectively together pray for God to work So what we're asking you to do is to commit. Just for one week, just try it out for one week. Let's just all say, this week, I will commit to at least once a day praying for God to work at Lakeside. And let's see what happens. Now, am I promising the miraculous? No. In fact... God may work in a way that none of us could even tangibly point to next week. Be like, oh, good thing we all prayed for a week, God. <laughs> but God's story isn't dependent on us. God's acting isn't dependent on us. And I promise you this, if we'll look for it, we may not see it a week from now. But we'll look back and we'll see what God was up to. You're just testing us out. Thanks so much for being here. So if you're bought in, here's the bucket. Here's the towel. Let's get to work. Because this isn't a rental car. This is ours. For the glory of God. God, I pray that you'd help us. I pray that you'd help us be committed I pray that you'd help us be devoted. I pray that you would do incredible things through us. I pray, God, that we would be unified. That we would put our differences aside. And we would keep you as our main focus. God, I pray that we would be invested in one another's lives. That no one who walks in this place would feel like they are alone. God, I pray that you'd help us learn. I pray that you'd help us grow. And I pray that you'd help us refocus. Seeing what needs to change. As we receive communion right now, God, I pray that you'd help us remember the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. On our behalf. Lord, I pray that we never grow weary, never grow tired, never grow comfortable with that message. And instead, 
that we would grab the bucket and we would grab the towel and we would impact as many people as possible for you. Do a work in this place, we ask. In your son, Jesus' name, amen.